Hey everyone, um, as Brian said, my name is Katie Seisland. I work over in Australia, actually in Sydney at Anstow. Um, and a little bit about me, you may recognise I don't have an Australian accent. So I'm actually a Kiwi born and bred, so I'm from across the ditch over in New Zealand. So for me, everything right up until end of PhD was based in New Zealand. So I studied engineering. Um, I've always loved kind of solving the problems and to, for me that led me into engineering. I looked at different materials. Um, so based in the kind of materials engineering space. Then I decided to continue on to do a PhD and during the PhD kept jumping across the ditch to the Australian Synchrotron and basically decided that I loved playing with epically shiny, ginormous bits of kit too much. So decided that was my next move, um, moved over to Australian Synchrotron to jump onto the SAX Beamline with the awesome team there. And I completed a postdoc there with a whole bunch of industry partners and research organisations, kind of connecting some of the New Zealand industry as well back over um, into Synchrotron Science World. After that, um, 20 months now-ish, I think I've passed the 18 month mark. I have now moved up to Sydney, so the Australian Synchrotron is owned and operated by Ansto. So I'm still within Ansto, I've just moved into a different state up here. Um, still very much focused on the wonderful world of collagen and investigating the nanostructure of collagen. So uncovering the nanostructure of one of nature's superhero fibers, which I will tell you all about. Um, yeah, yeah, so background, New Zealand is where it is in the world with that little arrow. Um, sometimes people don't know where it is. So when I say jumping across the ditch, across the ditch to Australia, hopefully it, it shows you a little bit of where it is geographically. Um, that picture is me, <laughs> me, our pet and craft days that we used to have in primary school. Um, in New Zealand, we actually take our pet lamb or our pet sheep along. Um, New Zealand is quite well known for having quite a lot of sheep, so mine were always lambs that we took along to Pet and Craft Day. So a little bit different to your standard cats, dogs, um, rabbits, whatever else you might have. All right, let's get into some research. So collagen biomaterials. When we say collagen biomaterials, what are they? Where are they in the world? What, how might you interact with them? So collagen is this beautiful long fibril that's actually in every single tissue, tendon, bone, artery, cartilage, organ, everything in your body has collagen in it. Where you might find collagen in everyday products is in things such as leather. So in your Ferraris sitting outside, they'll all be upholstered with leather. So there's collagen in all of them. And then there's collagen in a whole bunch of medical products as well. So things such as medical scaffolds, which are used um, to help out when your tissues might need a little bit of help. Um, for example, burns, wound healing, um, surgeons insert these medical scaffolds, and then your tissues grow into them. And things such as heart valve replacement. So collagen is... <laughs> A thousand percent a superhero. Um, it's super strong, it's super elastic, and it's also invisible, which when I do the um, primary school talks, this is something that, you know, when you look at your skin, you can't see these long fibrils in there. So it pretty much has all of the superhero properties of the Incredibles rolled into one little awesome fibril. The structure that we look at, so collagen has a really hierarchical structure. First of all, it's got a whole bunch of um, bundles of long fibers. When you look at these fibers, um, they look kind of like your bottom left screen there. Um, a whole lot of fibrils bunched together. When you look down at the fibril levers, you go down another level. Um, it looks like worms. So in microscopy or atomic force microscopy, you see these kind of worm structures. And then when you get down a structural lever again, you'll see that these banding patterns are actually made because within every fibril, there's a whole lot of um, tropocollagens, which are groups of um, collagen molecules twisted together in a certain way. So there's a whole bunch of different hierarchical levels to collagen. And SACS being awesome as it is, we can actually access structural parameters and define some of those structural parameters at different length scales. So into that structure again, we've got the um, collagen molecule alpha chain and that's a glycine XY repeat. When you twist up that, 
um, it forms that molecule. When you twist up three of them in the opposite direction, then it forms the triple helix or the triple collagen. And then over there you've got, depending on how these are staggered, they've got little gaps and little overlaps between them. And that forms that worm-like structure that you see in the microscopy images. How, what, what parameters of all of that sort of bundle of different levels of structure can we get from SACS? So we get the orientation index, which is basically an overall number from zero to one saying how aligned are all of those fibrils. So if they're all super aligned, all parallel to one another, then it will have an orientation index of one. If they're all higgledy-piggledy, squiggling all over the place, um, all mixed up between all the different layers, then it's got an orientation index of zero or closer to zero. We can get the despacing of the collagen fibrils, which is a combination of the gap and the overlap within that fibril, makes up one despacing period. We can get the intermolecular packing, which is inside those fibrils. Um, it's the distance between the tropocollagens, so it's kind of down a structural level. Um, and we can get things like fibril diameter and the direction that the fibrils are facing as well. What this looks like when we stick it in the beautiful Saks beam line is you get your wonderful diffraction pattern, which I always love for collagen because you get immediately when you look at the screen, you get arcs or rings showing those Bragg peaks. Um, you don't just get sort of some maybe line that you're wondering if it's maybe straight or maybe it's got a tiny wiggle in it. Um, so from collagen, we get some really beautiful things right off the bat. And depending on how you orient the sample, then the beamline, uh, you can then form the picture kind of on a 3D scale of what's happening with those fibrils in the material. So all of my work so far has been done at the Australian Synchrotron. So during my PhD, that was just a three hour flight um, over the um, water to the beamline and the SACS beamline here is where we did majority of the analysis of the samples. The beamline has since had an epic awesome shiny upgrade so it's got a ginormous um, vacuum chamber now instead of that tube that you see um, and when I was working on the beamline we used to spend ages <laughs> Every camera that's changed, we used to have to go in and manually, you know, unbolt and change all the pipes out and change the camera length with what tubes were inserted. Um, and now it's as easy as a click of the button. So it's much, much easier now. And it's, it's super awesome. What it looks like for my samples when they're in is majority of the time, I either do static samples or stretching of the samples. Um, static samples are literally just stuck on a plate like there. That one is a whole bunch of leather samples. Um, majority of the samples that I do, we're not hugely worried about hydration, um, but if we are, that's when we'll sandwich it in Kapton tape or something like that. And then there is a image of the stretching rig that we use. So it was a little custom built rig that now the SACS team can couple up with the beamline. And so as we go, we can um, get information about the structure of the collagen, and then we can stretch it a little bit and see what happens in situ as that stretching process occurred. We can now flip that whole rig uh, 90 degrees. Um, so we can now put the samples in compression as well. Um, which we have done recently with some cartilage, which was a little bit cool. We have done in our group a whole bunch of different, sometimes potentially crazy things like blowing up arteries and everything in the beamline. So we have a whole bunch of different setups that often will arrive on site and say, hey, we've got, you know, X, Y, Z, and we want to do these really cool things. And the SACS team normally manage to cobble something together if we haven't, or maybe we'll bring something that's not, quite optimized that they can think of better ways to do things. Um, so it's a super flexible beamline, which is awesome for all of our samples. And as collagen is in so many different things, often, you know, if you study a piece of bone, that's quite different to studying how an artery might inflate. Um, so you can imagine the sample setup is often very different. All right, we're getting to some applied materials. So all of my research throughout my whole PhD, postdoc, um, scientist position here kind of roles, they're all focused on applied materials. Um, so most of them are done in conjunction with industry partners. Um, and so 
we work with kind of products that are already out there. Maybe we might want to see what makes them strong, how we can make them stronger, what happens if we throw different chemicals at it, different mechanical processes, how we can improve our understanding of these materials and therefore improve the final product that's been manufactured. So first up is leather. And leather is where I first began. So I, being Kiwi, proud, um, have always had lambs, as I said, and ended up doing a PhD on um, how we can make sheep leather stronger. So sheep leather is essentially, it's half the strength of cow leather, which makes it a bit of a waste product at the moment. And if you can imagine, you know, sheep meat is used so frequently um, that anything we can do with these uh, waste products to turn them into byproducts, to um, inject some economic economic value back into the market with these products that are otherwise just wasted, then that's a really great thing. So we thought, okay, well, sheep leather is half the strength of cow leather. Why? What's going on? And collagen is one of the major um, components of skin, and skin is what is used to manufacture the leather. So this made for the perfect PhD project for me, which I started on. And so we took the two property, the two leather materials at the start, so the, the sheep and the cow, and said, all right, one's half the strength, why? Um, and we literally just stuck some little static samples in the beamline and discovered that their collagen structure was actually quite different. So this started us on the uh, journey of discovering the structure strength relationships present. So the more aligned you have of the collagen fibrils within the plane of the leather the stronger it is just like our superhero property is coming in here and what I mean by in the plane of the leather is that leather actually has two different layers to it um, and if the fibrils are aligned within those planes then that's what makes it stronger whereas if you were to look at say a cross section of leather if they were aligned in that direction it's actually really weak which comes into our pictures here. So looking at the strength when you look at um, the, the bottom line there with the little kind of diamonds cut out of them, um, they're pictures of, so we actually couple all of our sacks measurements up. Often if we're doing the, the structure strength relationships, we'll couple them up with lab tests such as tear tests, um, tensile tests, um, to see those physical properties and how they are impacted by the collagen structure. So when the fibers are all aligned like this, if you're looking through the cross section and they're all aligned vertically, that's actually called vertical fiber defect. And it is a defect known in the leather industry. And this makes the material really, really weak. You can imagine you could just apply a, a stress, um, pull it apart, and these, these fibrils would just pull apart like this. Um, when they're all kind of at a random angles to each other, when the orientation index of the collagen fibrils is low, then it's also a weak material. And when they're all aligned in the plane of the leather, that's what makes it really strong. Because what it means is when you pull, then the fibrils can actually take up the stress along their axes. And they kind of stretch a little bit themselves and that makes the material really strong. So again, got our superhero collagen fiber coming back because it's super strong. So we then thought, all right, well, we've looked at cows and sheep. Does this apply across other animals? Because we know that, you know, leather is made from deers, alligators. You might have crocodile shoes in your cupboard right now. Um, so does this apply to all leathers? And what we found across the ones that we studied is that it pretty much does. There's a the similar structure strength relationship between all of the leathers. So the more aligned the collagen fibrils are in the plane of the leather, the stronger it is. So after we looked at that, then we looked at a whole bunch of other things. So first of all, if you look at just the mechanism under which collagen stretches. So just as we take this piece of leather and we stick it in the beamline, what happens? What, you know, does something happen first or does everything happen all at once? And what we found is that first, if we take this piece of leather, if these fibrils kind of, they're not all perfectly aligned, what happens first is that they come into alignment first. So when you pull on a material, then these fibrils align. And then second, 
importantly, the despacing increases. So that means initially the fibrils are aligning, and then as soon as they're aligned, that's when they can take up that stress themselves. So then the fibrils start to stretch, and that despacing increases. So that was pretty cool looking at the mechanism of how these, um, what the nanostructure of the lathe is doing as we're stretching it. And then we looked at a whole bunch of different things. So throughout my PhD, we looked at things like how do tanning agents affect the material? Do different tanning agents make it stronger? What happens if we throw different cross linkers in there? Um, fat lacquer was a really important one. So fat lacquer is something that the leather industry uses to make leather really soft and supple and flexible. So it makes the, the leather that we know and love. If they didn't add fat lacquer, then you'd get this really crusty hard piece of material that wouldn't be much use for anything. And what we found is that even in just static samples, so just measuring the leather without stretching it, without you know, somehow pushing the fat liquor into these fibrils, the leather was stronger. So the fat liquor turns out that it's actually holding moisture in. And it's that moisture that then creates this soft, flexible material and it makes it stronger. We then looked at how that moisture um, content changed throughout the manufacturing process. So at every single different stage of the process, I went in and took a little sample. And let me tell you, the leather making process is not the most pleasant smelling process in the world. Um, so <laughs> we managed to take different samples from all of the different things, potentially should have worn a mask at all of these times. Um, but what we found is that across all of these different processes, the, the, the key driver behind the orientation in these collagen um, samples that we took was the moisture content. So the higher the moisture content, the higher the fibril orientation. So coming back to our beautiful superhero fiber collagen, it's super flexible, it's super strong, um, often because of some of the processes that they do to it and how this impacts the collagen structure. Moving on to medical scaffold. So leather for me was always my way into the, a little piece of the medical world. So collagen obviously is in, you know, every tissue, tendon, everything in our body, but it's also in all of these um, medical materials and devices that are used. Um, for me, medicine was never an option because I hate needles and I can't stand that. And my Dad was a doctor and I can't even stand the smell of hospitals. So we used to like sit outside because I refused to go inside when we went to draw pictures at work and things like that. So through through the wonderful world of collagen and leather, I've now managed to get a little bit into the medical world. So medical scaffolds was the first project that I took on. And I started this in my PhD because right from the start I said, leather's cool. Yeah, it can form the basis of my PhD, but let's get a few other projects in there, such as this medical scaffolds work. So the medical scaffolds, what do they look like? What are they? What do they look like? And here is an example of two different scaffolds. Uh, these are actually ovine for stomach scaffolds. So they're made from the tissue from um, sheep stomachs. And once they throw a whole different lot of chemicals at them, then they end up biocompatible. So your body will accept them and they end up looking like basically pieces of tissue paper. Um, not all of them have stitching like on that side. Some of them have no stitching. Some of them have little cuts in them throughout. Um, and then that there is just a really hydrated scaffold. And so you can imagine if they're taken from tissues from nature, often nature doesn't provide you with the absolute perfect base material to go from. And we know that things such as collagen orientation affect the strength. And so if you take a piece of tissue from an ovine for stomach, how do you know in which direction it's stronger? Because because in for stomach, are the fibrils all wiggly all over the place? Is it sort of uniformly aligned in one direction or are they all completely not aligned? And how do we know which direction is stronger? And if you, <coughs> if you imagine, if you've got an application, say for example, you needed a surgical um, procedure on your knee, and you had a burn or you had to heal, had to close wound, and you needed a medical scaffold, you can imagine it needs a bit of strength in a particular direction that it's stretching the most when you move your leg. And so the direction of that strength is really important. And this is something that wasn't known. So we took all of these pieces of scaffolds and we took one and then we scanned 
many, 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 many points across it to find out, all right, is, is there an orientation here? And we found out then, yes, there is. Um, there, it is more, much more aligned in one direction. And so then noting that direction, we then cut pieces of scaffolds that had the collagen fibrils oriented either parallel to the direction of strain we were applying or perpendicular to the direction of strain we were applying. And what we found is that when the fibrils were parallel to the direction of strain, which is similar to the same mechanism of strength that was in leather, then the fibrils could take up that strain immediately and they could um, kind of stress the, the despacing increased immediately. They were right along that alignment. And the collagen fibrils, because they were sort of aligned at the start, they didn't need to realign much more. Whereas those that were perpendicular, first when we pulled them, they kind of started to align, so they went way less aligned, and then they got pulled into alignment again. And so when you look at the sax patterns that we got, just straight off the bat, you can see that they're quite different, and that the parallel to the strain, when that, that medical scaffold was pulled, the collagen underwent that two-step process. Whereas when it was perpendicular, it underwent the three-step process. And what we found in this men is actually those perpendicular to strain were way weaker. It was so much easier to pull them apart. Again, if you think of all these collagen fibrils vertically aligned, you try and pull them apart. It's going to be much easier than if they're all aligned in this direction and the fibrils can uptake that strain. So parallel to the strain wins the superhero fight on this occasion. Next medical exploration was based in heart valve leaflets. So heart valve leaflet replacements are these little contraptions here. And what they are is it's three tissue leaflets. So this is made up of um, a whole range of different tissues, such as pericardium, which is the outside sac of the heart. They take tissues from cows, sheep, something like that, and they have these three little leaflets. And then they put it in this little metal contraption around the outside. And then it concertinas up really, really, really small. And then this is inserted up through an artery. So you don't have open heart surgery or anything if you need an open heart, if you need a heart valve replacement. So avoiding the open heart surgery is great. You can imagine if someone is sick, if they have a not so healthy heart and they need a heart valve leaflet replacement, then often they may have other complications, such as they may have blocked or semi-blocked arteries. What this means for this device is the diameter of the artery that it has to fit through is now much smaller because there's that little blockage in there. So the smaller that these can squish up to, the better it is and the more that can be done and avoid that open heart surgery. So to squish it up smaller, we need that tissue on the inside to be thinner. So if it's thinner, you can swish up smaller, you can get into many more patients. But if it's thinner, then it probably has less collagen. Is the collagen in a different orientation? Perhaps it's weaker. And these little guys need to go into the heart and have a really long life of service for the patient who's receiving them. So we set out to test um, a couple of different tissues that they currently use to make these devices to see what's going on, what's the story behind the collagen structure in these little guys, what's happening, and can we decide which one's stronger for reasons of the collagen structure on the inside. So again, we took it to our favorite beamline, and we put in pieces of pericardium, which again is that outside sac of the heart that they use for tissue leaflet replacements. We used two different types that are uniformly used in the industry, adult pericardium, and neonatal pericardium. Adult pericardium is much thicker, and neonatal pericardium is much thinner. But what we actually found is that neonatal pericardium, even if you just look right now at these sex patterns that we got, is so different to adult pericardium. And so the full circles around that adult pericardium shows that the collagen fibrils are not aligned at all. So as soon as we get full rings, then the collagen fibrils are wiggling all over the place. Whereas the neonatal pericardium, you just see the little arcs on the side. And that means that the collagen fibrils are really aligned. When we bring in our little um, strength test as well, what we found is that when we relate that structure to the physical properties of the material, 
then the really aligned high orientation index neonatal pericardium was much, much stronger. And the adult pericardium was much weaker. So this was really a huge win um, for all you know, industry partners, us, everyone, because it means that the adult pericardium, which is much thicker, is actually weaker. So the thinner material that is much stronger and therefore can squish up into that really, really tiny, smaller device, it can withstand all of the pressures and stresses that are required to squish it up real small, get it into place and then open it up so it can keep working for the rest of its life and it can continue on for hopefully a really long life of service in the patient. So in summary, um, my research career so far has most definitely focused on the structure strength relationships of this beautiful fiber of collagen. I've looked at a whole bunch of different materials and it basically comes back to the more aligned uh, collagen uh, material is with its fibers, the stronger it is. And that in things such as medical scaffolds, we need to understand that relationship and understand which direction those collagen fibrils are in. Um, so those scaffolds, for example, they now just put a little tiny cut in the corner of that scaffold. So the surgeon knows when he's, you know, in the operating theatre and he rips open the, the sterilised scaffold, he knows which direction the collagen fibrils are in and therefore can place it in situ to optimise the outcome for the patient. So more aligned, stronger material. I'll keep going and see if I can find a collagen material that differs, but I'm not sure I will. And it's all about kind of bridging the gap between how we can connect the awesome, shiny, epic, cool world of sacs to collagen materials and industry applications. And of course, collagen is 100% a superhero fibril. Um, I hope I've managed to show you that it's super strong, it's super flexible, um, it's, it's semi-invisible because you can't see it in your skin, so it is most definitely part of the Incredibles. And I would definitely like to thank all of the beautiful A-team. I think you may have seen this picture a number of times now in Helen's talk and as well as Susie's. This is the beautiful team shot of the SACS team and everyone who has contributed to the SACS beamline over the years. Um, and they have just been awesome with any requests that we have. We bring along weird and crazy ideas for different experience experiments on how to inflate arteries and blow things up in situ and squish things and um, throw different crosslinkers and chemicals at them and see what happens and they have facilitated everything um, so 100% a shout out to the beautiful wonderful sex team at the Australian Synchrotron and everyone who has helped in the research process along the way as well as all of the industry partners that we've worked with um, up till now on all the different materials that we've worked with Thank you very much for listening to my talk. And if you have any questions, then I'm free to take them now. Mm -hmm.